Um, welcome everybody to the Irish Iron Podcast. Um, my first guest on the podcast is Carlo Sullivan, who is I've known him for eight nine years at this point. He's been competing in the bodybuilding scene and acting as a personal working as a personal trainer for a good manner of years. And um, how are you doing, Carl? I'm great. Uh, how's it going, guys? My name is Carlos Sullivan. I am a personal trainer and online coach based out of South Dublin. Yeah. How are you coping with the lockdown? Oh, it's not too bad. Um, I'm, you know, surviving. I'm going for sea swims every single day. Still getting my training in. I've set up kind of a makeshift shed or a makeshift gym in my shed, which does the job. Still eating loads of food and just. Getting, getting out for walks and trying to keep things productive, you know, yourself. No point sitting around. No point sitting around at all. No. Like, I, I, I've ordered some bands and handles, like good bands and handles, and have pulleys and cables ready to go. Yeah. Have a pull-up bar I made. So once those arrive next week, I'll start training again. But I haven't done anything for a full month. So yeah. I, I took it as a break. So I was like, grand mm. no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. Look, at the end of the day, that's why I said I'll do the podcast now because they, they, there's a lot of free time on people's hands, and with all the negative vibes going around from you know the, the news outlets and the media, they said yeah. let's do something a bit more positive. I mean, good. good yeah, of course. Education, bit of entertainment, and um, yeah. you know, get the voices out from from people. I'm, I'm all about that entertainment. Love it, man. I love it. Yeah, man. You'd be fairly active on the social media, whereas I've I've been on and off it. Like I, this is my first foray into it since the YouTube in yeah 2018, and that really mm. didn't carry over. But this podcasts are much easily digestible. I think. Like yeah. When, when you're doing people, walk- people don't have to watch them. They can just when they're out in their walks or their runs or whatever, they can just tune in. So it's handy. And it's dead, you know. I have, I, I was even thinking as this goes on, I, as I was saying to Matt, we could do a round table discussion with people, just get different people involved, and be it be, be be entertaining. It'd be like a yeah. debate, and probably plan that ahead. But we'll get started mm-hmm. into your journey. So I remember yeah. when I first heard about you, it was through a mutual friend of ours. Yeah, and I remember he had told me that you started off like at 40 kilos you used to weigh 40 kilos before you started mm. any weight training and would i be wrong in saying that you had a bad relationship with food back then? yeah so basically yeah i was about 44 45 kilos and i i technically had an eating disorder it wasn't like an eating disorder that like it wasn't anorexia or it wasn't bulimia it wasn't me looking at myself and being unhappy with the way i looked and as a result eating what it was was a lot of kind of different things that I didn't like about myself or I didn't really accept about myself that just kind of gave me a huge amount of anxiety um, that basically when it came to eating food, I didn't enjoy the process of eating food. And I didn't recognize what it was at the time. And to be honest, it's taken me a long time to recognize that it was an eating disorder that I had. And at the time, basically, I just thought I didn't like food. I just thought like I was a very picky eater and I'd like, you know, there was times where my mum would be giving me dinner and I'd pick at it and then leave the plate or sometimes I'd sneak away and throw like half of it in the bin or most of it in the bin. And again, like looking back, that was a huge disorder. But because it wasn't anorexia and it wasn't bulimia, I didn't recognize it as an eating disorder, to be honest. That's mental. That's mental because yeah. it's all when, 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 you're, when you're in that position. You you definitely don't see it for what it is until you no. look. And but what yeah. made you? What made you like? Because it's obviously a big jump to go from from that kind of mindset to mm. starting weight training. Like you obviously like to yeah. get on some weight or. So, I mean, when I was in school, I was in secondary school. I was in a private school, and it was um, mostly a rugby based school. Um, right. so a lot of people around me were like rugby players. And they were quite like big guys and stuff like that. So from a young enough age, I was actually kind of made fun of for being like quite small or quite slender and stuff like that. And even just 
like my physical appearance in general is made fun of like because I don't know my my face or whatever I don't I don't even know I don't even know to be honest but so basically as you do in kind of fourth fifth year I started going to the gym as most people would what really kind of spurred me on per se was I was doing a module or I entered a module in school called exercise education which was pretty much where you go to the school gym and you learn like the basics of how to lift weights and the teacher of that at the time actually came up to me pulled me aside and was like you're actually too weak to do this <laughs> so uh you know nothing makes you nothing makes you more determined i think than someone telling you you can't do something that's crazy so that's i kind of just had this fuck you attitude with that and basically started going to the gym then i went to like a leisure center gym up the road and it kind of just went from there i took advice off people mostly online on like internet forums they don't really exist much anymore but like there was like boards.ie um bodybuilding.com a little bit uh the universe and nutrition forum those were the three that i kind of took information off of different people and learned from there and just kind of went from there deadly because i like 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 nowadays like in my head anyway, like if I saw someone like yourself coming into a gym, mm -hmm. you don't tell them that they're too weak to do it. You're, you're meant to be the yeah. bridge between um, getting them to a place where they're capable of, of, of exercise. Yeah. To a, Abs oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and your man being in the position of authority and stuff, definitely, it definitely wasn't his place to say that. And I think back then there wasn't as much focus on say things like mental health and stuff. So no. it was just more like this whole tough and up attitude, you know what I mean? So, oh yeah, you're too weak to do this kind of thing. To be honest though, it was a blessing in disguise because as I said, that really spurred me on to just go and do it then, you yeah. know? Absolutely. And I remember, I remember like when I saw you the first time, you doubled your body weight. I think you're walking around to 86 or something. 86. So, so, so yeah, the heaviest I ever got up to was 88. At the moment, I'm about 82, 83. Yeah. But from, from 44, 45 kilos, within four years, I got up to like 80. So, yeah, yeah it, was, it, was a big, it was a big jump. A big jump, man. But the thing is, yeah. as well, like, I like, again, on the mental health side of things, like, like that, that's kind of why I said I want to get into the personal training because a lot of my mental anxiety and stuff has been it's been lessened i would say by going to the gym and stuff yeah. like that so but again like the toughen up attitude i think that's kind of going away i think it's kind of if a lad well, wants to help they will help you now but yeah it's 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 so counterproductive that whole toughen up thing it doesn't really apply at all you know and no. um, there's a very small minority of people who that will actually work for and yeah, a lot of people it's just gonna crush them you know oh, yeah 100 percent, man 100 percent. but the main thing i have in my mind when i started training like when i was 15 i knew i started training because of bodybuilding like that's that's that was my main focus um comic books and bodybuilding but on your end were you yeah. aware of the competitive scene or when, when you got into it or was it completely unknown to you um no, I mean, I first kind of got aware of it through internet forums again. I think there was a guy on the Universal Nutrition Forum who was competing in NABA Juniors. Um, Owen Kane was his name. And I remember I was watching his progress. He had a little blog on the, on the forum. And then I was like, I was like, okay. I was kind of interested because I was on these forums. And I was like, right, I'll go to support him. So I went to the NABA um in 2009 and it was in the olympia and i basically that was my first show and that's i just kind of got i mean I, I think i just saw everyone in like this amazing shape and was just kind of like interested from there mm -hmm. then basically with my own competitive kind of streak or how i got into competing myself was actually one of the one of my brother's friends who i actually got a lot of advice off on it funnily enough he was on that universal nutrition forum as well he competed in 
uh, drug-free powerlifting, but he also was very knowledgeable in nutrition and training and stuff like that. And he approached me after I had put up like photos on Facebook from like when I was away on holidays and I was kind of leaning off and he approached me and was like, you should compete in bodybuilding. And I was like, well, I don't think I'm really big enough. And he was like, well, no, there's natural bodybuilding federations in the UK. There was none in Ireland at the time. And he was basically like, I think you do okay in, in the juniors there. You'd be suited to it. So then I was like, oh, okay. So then I done my first prep. He kind of helped me with it. I had um, help from a few different people, to be honest, and kind of went from there. Deadly. And how did you do in that first competition? Oh, I got nowhere. Yeah, that's always Oh, I got absolutely nowhere. But, like, I mean, looking back, it's hilarious because I didn't know how to pose properly. My tan was the brightest out of everyone on stage. Um, I didn't have enough muscle, didn't have enough condition. Every, everything went wrong that could have gone wrong, but I learned so much from it. That can know. make or break it, oh, man. It's like I, I yeah. tell people this, like, the biggest motivation I got was from losing. Um, mm. And I was in a, like, I mean, you're a, we competed in my first show. I mean, I was lucky that I did place quite well initially. Mm. But, but looking back, I'm kind of like, if I hadn't placed as well, I probably would have been a bit more motivated in a sense. Yeah. Well, you're, well, so how old were you when you competed the first time? You were a junior. Um, I think I was, I think I was about 21. Young enough. Young enough. So, yeah. 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 Then what was the next stage, next stage beyond that? So. so basically came around from that the main bit of feedback I actually I didn't even get judges feedback it wasn't like something I, but it was just kind of from putting up photos um, someone said to me like you need to bring up your hamstrings yeah so then I actually competed the next year and had a like much better developed hamstrings but still kind of got a few things wrong with regards to you know condition um, tan was way improved so it was really dark darkest on stage I think but condition was the main one that was after I think an 18 week prep and then that was when the NBFI it was the first year of the NBFI in Ireland and that was in oh, September so I done my second show was the BMBF Central which was in I think June July so then I actually kept dieting for like another 10 11 weeks for the NBFI and I actually dropped muscle that was funny because I just chased condition. I just, yeah. I just was like, right, I need to be absolutely peeled here. And where I competed in the BMBF Central, I think I was like 72, 73 kilos. Then when I went to do the MBFI, I was 68, like, which for me, at being like 5'11 is way too light for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but that- again, that was, a, that was a learning experience because that was the first time I ever properly got like dice shredded, like, and it kind of taught me, it taught me a lot of things. That prep, I'd done a lot of hit training for cardio. So interval sprints on like the cross trainer, I remember I was milling it out of it. And like I said, I dropped muscle because I just wasn't recovering from these torture yeah. sessions. But at the same time, at the same time, do you think you had to do that? Like, do you think back then, like, like, I see, I've never gotten to that kind of condition yet. Okay. Yeah. In your yeah. end, do you think because you got there, mm. now you know your body a little bit more and you're able to not come in so not lose so much weight, like you found mm. you, you'd be you'd be able to get into that same level. Your body's okay mm. getting there, but you'd mm. be able to hold a bit more tissue, you wouldn't have to burn as much. So, yeah. So Basically, I think besides doing the hit cardio and stuff, I think an approach that I took then, which I I would never advise a natural bodybuilding to take again, is dropping my carbs like super low and dropping my fats super low. Yeah. Because like whatever about like the enhanced individuals where they have all these other tools in their box, as a natural, you don't. So carbs have to be one of your main fuel sources to fuel your training. So your, your sessions are still intense. So you're maintaining that muscle tissue and you're staying nice and full. Yeah. And without that, yeah, you're, okay, you're in a caloric deficit, but 
you have no tools left in your box pretty much and that's why you like you'll often see a lot of natural competitors come in like stringy even if they're conditioned and it's because they haven't kept their carbs nice and high basically fucks with your hormones as well like i mean your test oh, yeah. is gonna be all over the shop when you drop carbs and fats to basically trace levels like look yeah i mean if you if you go very very low fat your testosterone is going to drop your hormones are going to be flat like your yeah basically your libido is going to be non-existent but look calling a spade a spade i think you can agree that if you're getting into a shredded condition state anyway your hormones are going to be fucked you're going to regardless you're, you're you're going to be so focused you're not going to be thinking about anything else but stepping on stage at that point anyway do you yeah. you, you don't care like it's not no. it's it sounds it's so, not a priority sounds so selfish but it's so true like you get to yeah. but yeah. and then after that but you what i've always respect about you is unlike a lot of natural bodybuilders who just stay in the natural feds you've competed in every single fed in the country at some point <laughs> you haven't placed badly in, in yeah. all either like you've, no. always, you've had the condition card and you've had certain body parts that have always stuck out like you've always had the legs and stuff like mm. that as well and do you think do you think like a lot of a lot of na- uh, enhanced bodybuilders would underestimate a decent macro bodybuilder like they think because they're taking certain supplementation they don't work as hard as a natural bodybuilder would to get into. I mean, everyone's different. So obviously, regardless of if they're natural or enhanced, some people don't work hard enough. Yeah. So I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say one way or the other. Like, I, like there's some enhanced bodybuilders who work their fucking arse off just the same as a natural is going to work their arse off. Yeah. And then there's natural bodybuilders who, who come in not conditioned as well. So, but what I would say is I think I've placed quite well in the untested federations because I had condition. Yeah. And I think sometimes people underestimate just how conditioned you have to get for these kind of things. So they take their progress photos in the best lighting, you know, after a gym session where they have a pump, you know, and then they put a few filters on it and they put it on Instagram and they get whatever amount of likes or whatever and people telling them, oh my God, you look amazing. But, you know, that's not bodybuilding. That's not the stage. No. The stage lights are harsh, you know. That, 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 um, that's social media for you. But yeah, that, and I think, I think everyone can look great in a photo where there's no one else in the photo. 100%. And you people know? Photoshop pictures now as well. I mean, there's been... Oh, few, I know. Not naming names, but there's a few competitors in Ireland who yeah. have been well known to Photoshop their pictures and the actual... Not even just filter. It's the proportions of their limbs. It's and huge. Stage and they usually look yeah. not good. So. And, and, then, and then people are taking photos of them and putting up and going, Jesus, you know? But at the end of the day, that's their, that's their own fault. Like, I've no sense yeah. of that. Like, so. No, it's, it's idiotic, really. Then over the, over the years, though, would you say that you've, like, you, I've trained with you a good few times and you're, you're yeah. able to keep up with, everything i've done i've got to do what you've done it's always been intense we've always had good sessions yeah what would you say who would you say taught you how to train with that intensity like what was who was your did you have any mentors or did you have any like guys you looked up to as to training when you got started i mean i like looking up to people when I started training, I, I looked up to a few kind of like say fitness models. I remember Rob Riches was one I looked up to a lot because he competed natural in the early stages. He was in very good condition. He competed in the same place I competed in the BMBF and I looked up to him, but I wouldn't say I, I took his training modalities. I think it was just more like I liked his physique, you know? Yeah. Um, I think our, our mutual friend, Aaron Power, Basically, he took me through a leg session at one stage. I think it was in between, like, after I had competed once, so it was 2012 or whatever, and I just remember the intensity of that session was, like, next level. I remember I was on the leg press, and we were doing, like, a drop set or something. And as, as 
as as a personal trainer would sometimes they go okay give me like 10 more and you do the 10 and then they're like okay give me whatever another 10 or whatever and i just got really pissed off i was like do you know how to fucking count like and everything and at one stage i literally i locked the leg press like mid set and like crawled to like a fire escape and just got sick everywhere yeah come the aaron comes up to me 30 seconds later and goes come on you have to finish off your set and i was like oh okay <laughs> so then we finished all like I finished off the set and I finished up the whole session and like it was so intense and I think that kind of flipped the switch where I was just like right this is kind of what I have to do yeah. um, especially for leg training like like my legs are probably my strongest body part and there's a reason it's because I trained them really really intense and um, more recently I mean last year at one stage I done a leg workshop with Locke Gannon and Again, that was super intense. Yeah, I have again, been if, to come on here, man, as well at some point. So I mean if training. if the switch had kind of like in any way gotten, say, laxed or whatever, or if my intensity had gotten laxed, that fucking skyrocketed it back up straight away. Like um that was a that was a super session. And I advise anyone listening, if you haven't done a session with Locke, just do it because it's fucking awesome. Um, but be prepared to literally give it absolutely everything you have. Yeah. It's not one of those sessions you can do every every five days. You have to... You, you do. Oh, like, I think I couldn't walk for about two weeks, but yeah. it was excellent. And then more, even more recently then, I've been getting coached by Lou Kaufman from the Muscle Mentors. So he's been coaching me since July um, last year. Because I went to a good few of their seminars and stuff and then just decided to hire him as a coach. So he kind of keeps me in check now with regards to my intensity because I'll send him like training clips. And if there's anything that he's like, you could push that harder, he'll tell me. So, And he, you'd, be, you'd be very much an advocate of like preserving your body. So like the way a lot of uneducated people in terms of training, they'd look at the way you train and mm. like... I, not even uneducated. Let's just change that term. I'm gonna say, the typical meathead. Yeah. Look at the way that, like you train now, and they they'd say that that's that's not hard training. Whereas on the other hand, you're probably of the mindset that look, you're getting as much muscle growth and activation and stimuli as you would be doing all these movements that would lead to injury or. Or, or lead to joint, you know, wear and tear yeah. and stuff like that. Like, w do you do you find there's like a mix of the two you can do, or w what's your whole take? Like, your training's evolved massively. Like, that's, that's yeah. I mean, I think depending on your training age as well, like how long you have been training, it really depends what you can handle, as well as like your recovery capabilities and all these kind of things. I think. If you have been training a good while, I think training the failure is something that I'd be a big advocate of. But a lot of people misconstrue what training the failure actually is. I kind of think that training the failure is going in and doing, say, two to three sets, like as hard as you can, you know, for a certain rep range. Mm. And, you know, not, not basically then doing an extra five sets on a lighter weight. You know what I mean? I think that's kind of something that a lot of people implement, and it's basically junk volume. Yeah. So if you if you have the energy to do an extra five sets, you didn't give your first two and three enough intensity, in my opinion. No, I agree. I agree one hundred percent. Like what I've taken, what I've 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 said. Look, training to mechanical failure is what you want once you break out of a solid mechanical position and you're in injury prone territory yeah. that's that's when you want to stop so yeah i mean like obviously sometimes there's a time and place to really push intensity and do these batch shit sessions where like we said you can't walk for a week two weeks or whatever but they're yeah. few and far between and that's not that shouldn't be the vast majority of your training sessions yeah. Because the most important thing is that you are recovering from your training sessions, especially if you are doing like a legs push pull or an upper lower kind of thing. If you're doing what we call, you know, a bro split where you're doing one muscle group a week kind of thing, then I guess you could warrant these super intense sessions 
because you do have the whole week to recover from it. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Like I think, I think there's like benefits to both. I mean, there definitely is benefits to both ways. Like, I even got into a place where I was doing double sessions a day. Mm. But it was like a bro split in the sense that I was hitting shoulders in the morning and then I'd come back. I do a bigger muscle group in the evening, like quads, and then I take yeah. a break in the middle of the week. So in terms of But again again, you have like cards of play that you have the recovery capabilities for that that I wouldn't have. That's very true. Like I I, I suppose like that's the, the, the a lot of like a lot of natural guys that I've trained with. It's been very intense. Yeah. But it's also a case of it's they're now I could be completely off the ball in saying this, but would you say an actual would be more suited to higher intensity or more volume based training? Like w- would you say higher intensity would benefit more as opposed to lots of volume? Uh yeah. I th- I think kind of as opposed to like the super like high volume where you pick five exercises and do four or five, six sets of them. I think if you pick seven to eight and you do two to three working sets, yeah. all out failure, I think that's the way to go. To be honest. 100%. Now there is going to be those outliers, obviously, who are the genetic anomalies and they can kind of just do what they want. Like, I mean, I knew- Yeah, but then you, you'd also have to look at these genetic anomalies and go, okay, what if they actually applied the principles that we're all applying as yeah. opposed to just kind of doing what they want? They might actually get better results. Oh, 100%. Like every single genetic freak I know, they don't train that hard. Like they, they're strong. Yeah. They can push weight. But there's but so I, much difference to pushing heavy weight and actually training with intensity. Like I think it's one of these things, though, if it's, if it's come easy for someone, and this comes with anything in life, I think if it comes easy for you, you're not going to want it as hard and you're not going to work as hard towards it. Yeah, 100%. It's 100%. The problem is a lot of people in that zone won't admit that because they've gone no. away with it for so long. But at the end of the day, it's, 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 look, it's a learning process. Obviously, you're going to grow as you get older. You're going to get more seasoned and, like, I mean, I, I think the best thing that happened to me as a trainer was getting injured because if I didn't get injured, I wouldn't have had to rotate my training around it and learn new things. Mm. And yeah. That position with your knees. I mean, I remember training yeah. with you and you had your knee issues at, in your 20s. So, like, yeah, so I actually have, like, well, I have a genetic problem with my knee where yeah. basically uh, my patella kind of runs off track um so basically it's like bone rubbing off bone kind of thing and that's like a genetic kind of thing my dad has it as well and stuff but also i'd say from kind of squatting the wrong way when i was younger all this kind of stuff doing a stupid amount of volume that i wasn't capable of doing way too heavy weight all this kind of stuff it definitely didn't help so and then I think another thing was like not training my glutes or my hamstrings enough and focusing too much on kind of quads for a long time. So yeah. it basically led to my knees basically being in bits. And there was a stage where if I was sitting up from a chair, I'd be in absolute agony with my knees. And I remember even up when I was doing my PT course, we were doing like pump classes and even doing a body weight squat would leave me in absolute bits. Yeah. Crazy, man. Crazy. Um, I mean, it's, I even stuck up a video today, man. Like, it was from, oh, God, two years ago. And it was a f- 28 plate leg press. And I was like, yeah. if I did that now, yeah, there is no way in hell I'd do it based on the, the, the quads would be sore, everything would be sore. But yeah, the based knee, on what you know, yeah. the knee pain, there's no need yeah. to push. I think I, it was heavy, but not like stupid. I, I don't think people look at it in the long term. I think people want these like you know these highs now or whatever, or pushing the load or doing all this kind of stuff, going to, you know, ass to grass and their squats, all this kind of stuff. And I, I think they want, they want that kind of satisfaction now, but they're not looking at it long term. Yeah. So if you're playing the long game and you actually care that you know that when you're older that you can actually, you know, get out of a chair on the sisters. Get out of your bed and go for a shit and not have to worry about your knee pain. Like, I mean... Yeah, that you don't, that you don't need a carer to help you, you know, get up out of a chair. 
100%. And you'd be a proponent, you'd be very much a proponent of the log book mentality as well. You'd do it the right way. Like you, you already have that knowledge base in place where you have so much training under your belt that you've gotten to the point where you do, you, you'd write down your main sets and stuff like that. And progress in that way. I mean, I yeah. see a lot of young guys coming into the gym and they start off on that. And I'm kind of like, you don't need that initially. Just learn how to do it all first. And then once you get mm. to a point, 100% stick in what you want to stick in but that a lot of people when they're getting into training, it's not like when we started like that yeah. wasn't the thing when we started no like nowadays it is a case of I think they want to get to the stage of advancement before even getting the base and I'm like what's the point in that I mean do you think it takes away from the and you have to admit when we trained back in the day it was it was fun like it was fun yeah. To... oh yeah absolutely it was just crazy, but yeah, I don't think they enjoy it as much. I see, I see them, and I want to help them, and mm. I don't think they're enjoying it as much. Well, but, to be honest, I think like this. Okay, there's nothing wrong with someone like doing a logbook and keeping track of what they're doing. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. But I think, like you say, when there's young lads and they're chasing this like progression the whole time, but their their progression they're chasing is things like going heavier. So they're yeah. chasing, they're chasing weight, and they're chasing, you know, shifting heavier, heavier weight, heavier load. But what they really should be chasing is exercise execution. So yeah. they should be making sure that their form is absolutely perfect on absolutely everything they're doing. As well as that, I think what they should be looking at is that they can actually feel the target muscles working, and they can switch them on. So things like, you know that they can actually feel like a pull up on their on their lats you know yeah. that they can feel you know a leg extension on their quads all this kind of stuff and i, I think i not like there's not enough kind of mind to muscle connection focus for a lot of these young lads they just kind of want to go heavier and heavier and heavier and to be honest a lot of it is just ego they want to appear stronger to their friends their family their girlfriend whatever it is i think the best thing i heard the best quote I heard, and that's so. This this will sum it up. You don't want to get strong at bent over rows. You want to make your lats as strong as possible using bent over rows. Yeah. So like you don't want to make. You, there's no point. Like we're not powerlifters, so we aren't no. trying to. Like it's great moving heavy weight, but I mean, yeah. I remember back two years ago, I could rep out 160 on a bench. I wouldn't go near that now. There's no points. Like, it's mm. too injury prone, but that was chasing numbers. Yeah. Nowadays, it's definitely, like, I'm stubborn. You, you've known me so long. I'm stubborn. It takes me, like, maybe a couple of years after everybody else to hop on that curve. Yeah. But, like, looking at people like yourself, and you, you've developed, like, noticeable changes in your physique from, from this advancement in training. But yeah. again, you have to get that basic shit in first. You have to get in that bread and butter in first. And get a good base, and then your body will respond so much better to the advancement and stimuli after that. And regards nutrition, you'd be quite a big eater now, wouldn't you? You'd be pushing the food up quite high. Yeah. yeah. I, I would, and I do it with my clients as well if they're looking to make gains like to muscle tissue and stuff like that especially like being natural i think again it's another tool in my box that i can utilize so the higher i can push my calories without putting on too much body fat is the better really so i kind of i'd be a big advocate of eating up basically so you know progressing to the stage where you can consume a huge amount of calories but use those calories in your weight sessions so your weight sessions are more intense and just literally looking at the scales, looking at measurements going up and just being a bit progressive with that. Now, obviously, I think with myself, I'm quite an active person. So as well as kind of being on the gym floor, doing a load of steps and stuff, like you know me, I'm, I'm a highly strong individual. I have lots of energy. Yeah. So I'd, I'd burn a huge amount of calories on a daily level. So that's why I'm able to eat like 
4,000, 4,500 calories or whatever, and still be quite lean, still have abs, still yeah. have back definition, all this kind of stuff. Like you'd be eating more than I am at the moment for sure. I mean, yeah. I haven't, I haven't trained in four weeks, so my food has gone down back to three meals a day. Yeah. But but again, once the training stimuli comes back in, I boost the food back up and fill back out. But, yeah. But even I I think I think one thing that people don't put enough emphasis into is actually doing the same for females for pushing up calories for females, and I think it is due to this whole thing about girls being too scared to put on a little bit of body fat. And I think like looking at it, like calling a spade a spade, a lad can get away with a higher body fat than a female can because we like to wear baggier t-shirts. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if a shirt, if a shirt looks well on our chest, shoulders and arms, that's grand. Some lads will, will take that little bit of an extra belly or whatever for that. If they are just looking at purely aesthetics and, you know, getting the nightclub muscles, like a lot of young lads are, you know, but I think for girls, and it definitely is changing now, but there was a huge thing about almost a stigma about girls putting on body fat for, you know, gaining muscle. And I think a lot of it has to do like, if a girl has a, has a big enough belly and she's wearing like a tight dress or whatever, you know, it's going to show and she might be, feel a bit more self-conscious about that. Now, I think there's a wave coming in now where a lot of girls are trying to like grow their glutes and stuff like that. So they're accepting that little bit higher body fat and stuff to get that progress. And it definitely is shifting. But I think for a long time, there wasn't enough emphasis on girls actually eating up and eating all the, the calories. Like, I, like myself personally, I have some girls on 3,000 calories. And again, it's because they're highly strong individuals that they still have abs, you know? Yeah. But that being said, you, you'd be quite you'd prep people a fair bit. Like you, you'd have a good few clients and a lot of them would be females on the yeah. scene. And what I've noticed with your, with your clients as well, you've managed to, they don't look unhealthy. You know, no. they don't look like they're, they're going to fall over on stage, but they're in good shape. They're in good condition. And they have placed well, they've done well and they have a good bit of muscle on them. And yeah. what I've always respected about you is that you've, taking the time to learn about the female physiology and, mm. and and use that to your advantage like a lot of coaches i would i would know prep girls they put them on dnp and hope for the best but not naming names but i um mm. you know who you are but why do you think like do you think like there's definitely a growing female component in the competitive scene as well like there's yeah. so more women on stage and do you think it's just it's it's more accepted now for them to do it or do you think it's like well i think if if you look at you know the advancement in the amount of female classes in yeah. bodybuilding that's only a recent thing so bikini is only like i think 10 years old or something like same way men's physique is these are actually new enough categories so i think they're just growing with the sport with the sport and i think it only takes a few girls to do that and to, again, walk around and not be, you know, hyper muscular or whatever for more girls to go, oh, okay, I actually, I like that look, you know? I mean, that's the thing that there was only really women's physique and women's bodybuilding. Figure. Yeah, figure. figure. Yeah. That's all hyper masculine, hyper, hyper masculinity on a female body. And yeah, well, I, 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 I wouldn't say figure is. I'd say figure has a nice balance of, of being still quite feminine. Yeah, yeah. It'd be more women's physique. Women's That's, physique, women's yeah. bodybuilding, yeah. Yeah. That being said, I think we're getting to some of the questions because we have a good few. Yeah. So. A few of them are quite interesting. So I'll start off anyway. I have a good few here. So um, this is from, you got set this one. Yeah. So, what is your opinion on old school bodybuilders setting their ways and not taking on more up to date research into their training and coaching approaches? So, I'll rephrase that for the view for the viewers and listeners. So, basically, old school bodybuilding, like, do you think they're just stubborn 
or do you think it's just unwillingness to learn and say they can advance without having to do the stuff they used to do? So. Yeah. So basically what I would say is a lot of the arguments for the old school bodybuilders, the old school bodybuilding coaches of what they're doing is, oh, I'm getting results. So it's very much like this whole kind of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. Okay. So a lot of them would look and go, well, you know, I'm still getting results from my clients. My clients are still placing all this kind of stuff. One thing that they're not really, and I've, I've, I haven't really seen many coaches talk about this at all, to be honest. They don't talk about the aftermath of that client. No. So they'll show a result and they'll go, here's my client, whatever. Let's call him John. I don't know. This is John and, you know, he placed whatever first in his show. Um, he's deadly or whatever. I would love to see a post of John six months down the line. Yeah. You know? Same with, let's call her Jane, and Jane done her first bikini show, and she plays top three, and isn't she great, you know? You know, how was Jane three months after that show, you know? Did she get her period back? That's what I want to know. Yeah. I I actually don't care if she placed. I actually want to know, did she get her period back? You know, I want to see Jane two years from now. Is she able to have kids if she wants to? That's what I, that's what I care about. So... I, I think you can be a bit too results orientated and kind of care about the results more about the client and more about care about the results more about the process of how they actually got that result. Yeah. That'd be fair right. to say. Yeah, that no, that's a deadly answer, man. I'd be pretty much I'd agree with you there, man. Like um, so, I agree with you there. Yeah, so I think there's obviously different methods to do things and there's many ways to skin a cat. But I think, you know, let's look at the aftermath of the cat after you've skinned it. I think that's just, you know, that's a way to put it. Now, a lot of kind of older school coaches and stuff like that will have this whole argument of, oh, well, it worked back in, you know, the 70s in the golden era of bodybuilding. This whole, you know, well, you know, Arnie didn't do it like that, you know. Arnie, Arnie didn't train legs, push, pull. Arnie, Arnie didn't, you know. Well, but people don't like to say know that. So, you, yeah, you know, like a lot of these old school guys, they have all these. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, there's going to be yeah. people with genetic conditions, and they're going to yeah. be, you know, you know, made worse by doing bodybuilding. But mm. you can take care of yourself as well, and I no, that's a mm. great answer, man. Like I've I've nothing really more to add to that because that's that's. Well, I, I I'll just say this whole argument when they're saying like, oh well, that's not the way they done it in the seventies, and yeah. you know, Arnie Arnie didn't do it. Well, let's let's take away bodybuilding for a second, okay? Let's look at like, throw me a sport, throw me any sport. Oh God, I'll say um, I'll say rugby, I'll say rugby, rugby, okay. Do you think that the people who were playing rugby in the 70s, like, say, the Ireland rugby team, do you think their training was the exact same as it is now? Oh, do you no, think no. their nutrition was the exact same as it is now? No. No. But did they get results in the 70s in rugby? Absolutely. You know? So I think, like, just having this whole mindset of, you know, oh, well, it worked before, it'll work again. Yeah, it works, but it's not necessarily the best way to go about doing things. I think it's more, you know, accruing all the knowledge and and using it in a smart, productive way, you know. I mean, yeah. and we have all the tools at our disposal in terms of monitoring our bloods and, you know, you're actually able to take care of yourself that little bit more than you were back then too. So I think, yeah. like, while well, someone back then may, may have felt a bit shitty and they may have played it off, now if you feel a bit shitty... Just go and get your blood done. Simple as it's it's it yeah. costs you next to nothing and it's it's so easy. So yeah. easy. And, and like I said, with with a load of these kind of old school coaches, I what I'd love to see from them is just taking a little bit of the research into account. You know? Yeah. You don't have to change your whole method or anything like that, but at least take some of it in and you know be aware that there is better ways to do things than the way you are currently doing it. Yeah, there is some old school guys who I'll, I'll, I, I will say phenomenal coaches and they have adapted. I mean, Locke Gannon, 
would be very much a proponent of you get your bloods done, you give me your health markers, and then we go. Where, yeah, but I, I no, but I, I, I wouldn't call Locke Gannon an old school coach because no. I think he reads up into a lot of modern research and he utilizes it. He's a bodybuilder though, like he's been around for a long time. Oh yeah, no, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I wouldn't say his methods are old school. Okay, okay. Well, that's 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 a great answer, man. Like, I agree with you one hundred percent there. Right. This is a this is a question from my cousin uh, Thomas okay. um, Villian from Zinc Canada. The okay. only three exercises you can do for the rest of your life, go. No. Mm. Only three exercises I can do. Um, myself personally, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say like pull-ups, okay. like a pull-up variation. Um, I'm gonna say probably leg extensions because myself personally, I get a lot from them. Okay. And I enjoy them. Um, number three, um, I'm probably going to say like dips because I think if I had leg extensions, if I had dips and if I had pull-ups, I'd be able to develop quite a decent physique still. Average, 100%. So, so if, I was on a, if I was on a desert island and I had a pull-up bar with a dip station and a leg extension attached, I think I'd be all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. No, I'd be... I'd be my choices are completely different. Um, yeah. I would pick incline bench press. Um, I would then pick bent over barbell rows. And then I would pick kind of any squat variation, but that's just suited to my body type. And I, I like my squats. And incline yeah, yeah. bench press, I've always got a good bang for the buck and I've never been injured from it. Like I'm a mm. flat bench press is a no-go. And then, of course, bent over rows, I, I just... I love bent over rows. I've always felt a very, I've always felt a good mind muscle connection. And I think uh, any variations of dead stop or pend lays or, or, or whatever you want. And even with the squats, you can variate it. You can do the squat, split squats, front squats, back squats, whatever. And yeah. same with the incline, you can still. So basically, if, 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 if you had a barbell and just an incline bench, you'd be happy then on your I, desert island. Man, I was trying to get that for the bloody lockdown. And obviously, that didn't happen. But. Uh, <laughs> Sure, look, we'll, look, at the end of the day, it's, it's about finding the exercises that works for your body. Everyone's different. It, yeah, and like I said, like, I, I get a lot from leg ascensions, and I really enjoy them. I know some people might think that they're a bit of a bitchy exercise, but I don't feel that. They're brutal yeah. when you do them correctly. Like, they exactly. fuck you up. I mean, yeah. um, especially with occlusion training. Like, mm. my God, that's something else when you're doing those. Yeah, but, but I think... Exercises aside, one if if like let's just take the question. If you had one piece of equipment, I would have a Cybex Bravo cables because I think you can do pretty much everything with them. Yeah, one hundred. They're phenomenal. Yeah. Um. Okay, here's the big, the big question: Who, in your opinions, are the best top three Irish bodybuilders under ninety, and then the top three? Over ninety, and they have to be amateur. And just for, 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 we'll say training in the last five years. So they have to have competed okay. in the last five years, and uh, they can't be pro, obviously. So okay. make yourself go first with that, and then I'll say my choices. Okay. Again, I'm not a hundred percent on the weights of these guys, so I'm just going to take a guess at their weight. So if you are heavier, if you are lighter. And you're listening, don't take offense to this. So I'm gonna say under 90s. Um, I'm gonna say Leon or Bajan Strength on Instagram. I think he's I think he's under 90. I'm gonna presume he's under 90 when he's on stage. And I think I, I think he's a pro in the making, to be honest. I could see him turn pro quite soon. I could say next year he'll get it. Yeah. Um I would say uh, Alex Prado as well. He's just a very well put together physique. So dense. Nails his condition. Dense man. He's like five foot. He's shorter than me, and he's he's jacked. I'm like, yeah, he, phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, nails his condition. Just has did great with proponents as a bodybuilder, especially as kind of a shorter bodybuilder. And then I'm gonna throw a wild card in here, number three. I'm going to go with Daniel Agbor. 
Oh, does. Oh. Daniel Agbor, like he won the, the RBBF in 2015, I think it was. But then more recently, he's actually been competing in the BMBF and he's, he's, yeah, he's going through the ranks there and stuff. So. Yeah, he looked big last time we saw him. Though. He looked, yeah. He looked good. He's, uh, like, he, he, nailed, he nails his condition. He has a very good, well put together physique. Um, very full biceps, legs are very good and stuff. Yeah, it's just an impressive bodybuilder. Um, then over 90 kg, I'm going to go with, I think, I, I'm not 100% sure on his name, but I think it's Avarius. So he won the Mr. Ireland last year. I think he just super dense, um, really well put, put together physique, just has a lot going for it. Yeah, I'm gonna say uh, probably Brian Hickey just because track record nails his condition, very good poser stuff like that. And then I'm again, I think it was 2015. So and um, he's he lives in Donegal, so we're gonna call him Irish. I'm gonna say Ronan Doherty. So yeah. I think Ronan Doherty is a phenomenal. Dude, that's a blast. That is a blast from the past, man. Like, yeah, I think he's a. I think. But, yeah, I think yeah, I don't know what he's doing now. Some like some Jedi stuff or something, sitting on a rock or something. But um, I it's yeah, I think when when he wants to, when he wants to, he's a phenomenal bodybuilder. Phenomenal. Um, right um, on my end, under nineties, I would say Leon as well for the same reasons as you've stated. Um, I would then say I agree with you there on Alex Prado. I think he's just yeah. very, very well put together, very round. All the South Americans have those really nice round muscle bellies, and they're, you know they're quite proportionate as well. Mm. And then I would put in, oh God, I don't know, Ian McGarry. I think he's he's come, he's finally learned how to nail his condition a little bit more every single time. I think last year. When he won his class at the under nineties, yeah, he, he that was the first time where I've I've seen him and gone. Fair play, my man, because you've he he's been getting it. He's always had tons of dense tissue, you yeah. know, good back, great, like very good condition quads. It's always just been certain areas, and he's been working with Billy Byrne now, and I think they found a lovely formula. I'm excited mm. to see how he he goes on. I actually have him up as the next guest on the podcast. Oh, very good, yeah. I decided to discuss um, his future with him. Um, yeah. For over 90s, I would say, um, it's a bit different from yourself. I would say, mm. like Varius, obviously, I think he won the PC when he won the PCA Galway show, he looked um, nuts. Very pretty physique, yeah. very well put. And he's tall, he's quite tall, Like, but he, but he mm. doesn't look tall, which is a good thing. Yeah. I would say Christian McLinden would be up oh, there yeah. as well. Um, I mean, the guy came from, like, he'd be the first one to admit, like, he, he yeah, his first show wasn't great, but he's come on so much, and he's worked yeah. with a few coaches, and just nails conditioning, and he's a... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I'm excited to see him on stage the next time he gets on stage, because he's put on a lot of size recently. He's working with Pat, Patrick Tour, and yeah. I think he's putting out some great pros, and Christian is... Um, I would say he's a mass monster in the Irish scene anyway. There's not very many mm. guys as big as he would be in that condition. No. Then I would say again, um, I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to put Tommy out there because he did compete within well, the He's last... a pro? Is he a pro? No. Yeah, shit. So I can't put Tommy out there. Sorry, Tommy. No. Uh, <laughs> I'll put, I'm, I'm going to put Connor McGee out. And I'm going to say why. Okay. Because... The guy has managed to add so much ridiculous tissue. Like I've, I haven't seen anyone's quads like that in, like in a long time. For a tall guy, I know he's standing. A, he's around your height, five eleven, mm. but he, he walks around at like he was one seventeen, and I'm like, he's on stage and he's a he just needs that little bit more conditioning, that little bit more conditioning. But he's been he won his class at the PCA Galway, and I think he came second in the NABA. So I, yeah. I, um, but obviously there's a few names out there, man. Like I'd, I'd want mm. to. Uh, I think Cahill McConnell's great in terms of his condition. Yeah. Um, I think you have some phenomenal guys in there. I mean, 
Um, I mean, all the, the pros, I mean, we have some great pros as well. We have Shane Cullen, who's hopefully will make a splash when he competes. Um, he just mm. needs to fill up that frame a little bit more. We have mm. Vinny Crane, who's always, I mean, his, his track record speaks for itself. Um, and I'll be talking to him at some point too. And yeah. Shane, but uh, I've always liked Vinny. And, and then, of course, I, 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 I think on the pro scene, I think the person, obviously, besides Blessing, <laughs> Um, I think IB Sani yeah. is going to really fucking do well in that class of physique. Hundred percent, he's put together so well, and mm. and from speaking from like first hand experience as well in terms of like supplementation, nothing next no. to nothing. It's like just yeah. I think there's a few names out there I'm going to put out. Like I think Giovanni would be Giovanni Emeka. He was going to compete in the muscle contest. I think his mm. upper body is absolutely ridiculous looking. His back double looks nuts. Just yeah. his, those legs. And I, I, I think he just, when he trains, I've trained with him for a full year during my practice. And I just don't think he has that mind-muscle connection he does with his upper body, with his legs. But I think that will come in time. Then there's mm. a few great naturals, man, as well. I mean, you have um, Adam McDonald, who looks who, who, he windy overall. Yeah, time. yeah. And he's just conditioned and... He's a phenomenal natural bodybuilder. You have, you know, Akin as well, who's nuts. And, but I have mm. my, my own thoughts about that. But um, Yeah, I, I think Jay Robinson as well. If you're Jay Robinson, gonna... absolutely, man, 100%. Yeah. I mean, when he won the Nabby Juniors, I was, uh, you know, natural. I mean, mm. but then again, Dan Lennon. Dan Lennon won last year, and he was natural. So, yeah. like... Yeah, no, this we, we do have a growing crop of body. And then uh, my my buddy James Melville up north, a lot of people yes. wouldn't know him because he just yes. beats BMBF, but he's oh, phenomenal. He looks great, man. He looks really yeah. good. Then I, I got a slew of questions here as well. So some of them are good. So yeah. I think what I'll start from the top. So what would your thoughts on my fitness pal be? Like as a as a as a calorie tracker uh, prep. Okay. So I think it's it's decent. Like I still use it to to track foods and stuff like that. Um, I think if someone's never tracked their intake before, then using something like My Fitness Pal, it does definitely have merit. There is, of course, flaws with it. Like anyone can just enter any kind of an amount for a food, and if it's not an approved food, the macros aren't going to be a hundred percent accurate. Mm. Even if the macros are right, the calories could be off. And it's basically just because people round numbers up. So people have a tendency to round numbers up. So you could get a food and it could say it's 600 calories and it might be 800 calories or vice versa. I think, so I think it's grand. I think it, it, it does have a job. Like It does the job. But I think you can't be super anal about it. If you, like If you want to be super anal about it, the only way of really tracking these kind of things is to like a pen and paper type thing. But I don't really think that's necessary, if I'm honest. I agree with you there, my man. I think it's very good as being in the off season it's great. But like I mean, I think as a beginner, if you're trying to pack on a bit of size, pack on a bit of muscle or just track, I think it's very good for the basic stuff. Obviously when you're getting into the nitty gritty, I think calculating it yourself or using a bit more of an advanced app, if there is any out there. I wouldn't be too keen on it. I wouldn't be too familiar with them because I don't use them. I've yeah. always weighed out my foods and calculated it myself. Um, yeah. And then in the off season, I, I, I guesstimate. So I just make sure I get my five or five meals a day. And Yeah, have- I mean, the thing about it is, is there's going to be a 20% variance on food labels anyway. I think they're allowed about 20%. So it's yep. not going to be super accurate. But I think realistically, if you're doing a prep, I, I minimize the amount of, say, processed foods you're eating. I don't necessarily agree with having what I would call like a food list where you can only eat about 10 foods. I, do, I don't agree with that at all. But what I would agree with is to keep it mostly to whole sources. So yeah. if it's going to be whole sources, you're pretty much going to know, you know how many grams of protein are in a chicken breast and stuff like that. Yeah. Just keep it look, keep it as simple as you can, and look, you'll get the results. But obviously, make sure you're getting in 
a good macronutrient breakdown. I mean, at the end of the day, the worst thing you could do is cut out something entirely that is going to help the functions of your body outside of getting lean. I mean, like you need certain minerals, you need the vitamins. And, uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of people don't need enough vegetables, really, to be honest, year round. I wouldn't even say just when it comes to prep. Yeah, I, I have been working on it. <laughs> but that's just because you you you'd be on my back if I don't. But, I know. Um, definitely during the off season, it's more of a stick them in. But uh, yeah. Um, hobbies outside of the gym. What what would you do outside of the gym? Uh, so I'm big into acting. So I'll like I do drama. So the name Dramatic Carl doesn't just come from me being a bit mad. It comes from me being haven't done like speech and drama classes since I was like five years old so I do like plays I'll do like pantos and stuff I'll try get about two plays in a year kind of thing um as well as that I like skiing I haven't been skiing in a good few years but I do like it I've been skiing like over 20 times okay. so there is a stage sometime in my life where I want to like just do a year being like a ski instructor or something like that just for something different Deadly. Um, as well as that, I mean, I've recently taken up sea swimming. <laughs> so today was my thirtieth day in a row in the Irish Sea swimming. Um, I just, especially at the moment, I think there's so many things going on in the world that it's nice to just be able to just kind of jump into the freezing cold sea and forget about absolutely all of it, and just kind of de-stress. Um, besides that, just kind of you know, things like films. Um watching tv I, I like musicals as well i'd be a big fan of musicals which is I, I wouldn't say there's many bodybuilders that are big fans of musicals that's different man it's different yeah but, like i mean they're into i'd be look i'd be i'd be quite i'd be a big comic book fan i mean that's my source of that was what got me into the gym so comic yeah. books um i do game a bit um, I used to game a lot, actually. Oh, I used to game a lot. Before bodybuilding, I was, like, a consistent gamer. I owned every console from, like, the Atari all the way up to, like, the fucking Nintendo GameCube or something. Like, like I literally had, like, 20 or 30 games consoles. Um, what was it not say? so much anymore, though. Oh, man. No, those were the days. But they're, yeah. like, they're like, no, I, I think it's I'd be into that. And then... Again, I used to drum in a band, but I, I kind of put that to the wayside for bodybuilding. Mm. But outside, nowadays, man, I just, I'd be, ah, I'd, I'd be fairly a book reader, um, mm. stuff like that. But like yourself, like, I mean, I think it's very good to have something to occupy your brain a little bit outside of the weights because. Yeah, super I mean, important. Yeah, 100%. Um, Next question would be, um, best ways for office workers to prep meals. Okay, I think that. Um, I think it's a good question. I think what what I would say on that myself, just cook your food the night before the morning of. And I know most offices I used to. My last job was in management retail, retail management. So I was lucky mm -hmm. enough that I had an office mm. and I got to eat my meals on the go if, when I was doing administration work um, and keep them in the fridge. And I know most offices would have that kind of situation at hand where you can just yeah. bring the meals, bring them in and mm. it's not too hard to do. Most jobs will let you eat um, like that in an office. But um, if you're in a retail situation, it's a bit different. Um, yeah. But yeah, that would be it. I mean, I'd, I'd basically say when I consider office workers, I'm going to say something like the business sector. So that's the way I'm going to take it. I'd probably advise if you are going to go down the whole meal prep route, I'd probably advise to have two days in the week where you just prep and just cook for like an hour and a half, two hours. A lot of people like to do it on a Sunday and then kind of, you could even do it on a Sunday and put half your meals in the fridge and then the other half in the freezer and defrost yeah. them and stuff like that. I think that's a very good way. I think the important thing with meal prep, though, is just to make the meals interesting and not just have the same thing every day. Then you're just going to get bored and you're going to have a tendency to 
go, oh, I don't want that today, and to just like snack on different things that you don't really want, biscuits and all that make, kind of stuff. Make them edible. Make them edible. That's yeah. literally... I, I think as well, like there's a lot of merit to say like meal prep companies are quite good. I think there's definitely some ones that, especially because they take the guesswork of all the macros and stuff out of it for you. I know like, like shout out to Ray Body First Prepped. They're actually very, very good. I right. used them last year for a good while, for about two or three months. And their foods are really, really tasty. But on top of that, they have like good macros. And they have well, different options as well on their website where like you can have like, if you're doing a cutting plan or if you're doing like a bulking plan, like some of those meals have a thousand calories in them if you choose the bulking plan. Yeah. Which is pretty, yeah. which is pretty class. Like, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, like I, I've been blessed in, I worked in a, I worked in a restaurant for two years. So, I mean, in terms of cooking and prepping food, it's second nature when I do do yeah. it. So I think, but absolutely, meal prep companies, once you get a good quality one, and you're not the only one who's um, on the body first route. I've actually had a good few people um, to talk about them. So that's a plug for you as well. Uh, but um, yeah. um, no, that's it. That's, a, that's great. Um, what your favorite gyms and why? So there's no number on the gyms you can go on and I'd, I'd say we'd agree on a few of them anyway so I'll let you go first. In, in Ireland or are we just talking we'll stick with Ireland just for some time I'd say okay yeah but I'll, I'll say a few if you've been to any abroad throw them at me as well I've yeah okay okay so I can't really comment yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna give like I'm gonna give let's go with one Dublin one 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 uh one Leinster one, one Conniff one, one Munster one. Like, we'll do it like that, okay? Yeah, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, I'm going to go with Dublin. I'm going to go with Southside Gym because that's where I train and I feel like the equipment's really, really good. Um, the atmosphere is brilliant. Like, there's some fucking hardcore people in there. There's some hardcore yeah. training going on. Great uh, if you want to scream, if you want to scream your head off and stuff like that, it's allowed. Um, some people like Christian McLinden trains there. A few more bodybuilders and stuff. Uh, Ross Byrne, a few other people. So, yeah, uh, I'd go with that. Leinster. Um, I'm gonna say the the gym Newbridge is very very good. I haven't been. Is it is it uh, as better than Manus Revan? Yeah, I think it's just that little bit better. I think it's just that little bit more refined and stuff. Um, I was out there, what was it, tr three months ago at this stage? Like, I kind of, I don't even know what day it is, but I think it was about three months ago. Um, and yeah, I was really impressed with the place. I thought it was very, very good. The equipment's top of the range kind of thing. Um, let me think. Ulster. What was the one we went to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few, you see. I'm actually going to say, there's one, the compound room, which James Melville owns. It's actually kind of like it's a members-only gym, but I've had the privilege of training there a few times. And the equipment's brilliant. Like, live fitness and Cybex for, for all the leg kits. Um, just, yeah, really, really good machines. The atmosphere is brilliant. Like everyone there, like no one has headphones in. Everyone, the music's good and everyone's just kind of friendly. You know, they're just all kind of like after their sessions, they're chatting a bit. There's a good social aspect to it. Um, like I know James quite well. He's a very, like he's very sound. And they've actually recently moved into a new, a new uh, unit, which is even bigger than the one they were in before. So I haven't checked it out, but I've, I believe it's very, very good. So I'd actually go with that. Mm. Um, if I'm gonna say, let me think. I need to. I need to think of my provinces again now. So I'll go back to school. You're on Connacht now. Uh, Connacht. I'm gonna go with Galway City Gym. Oh, I think it's really good. There's a lot of history there. Um, I think yeah, it's just good atmosphere. It's a good kind of good place to train. Munster, Munster Pro Fitness is phenomenal. I honestly think it's, it's probably one, of, it's probably the best gym in the country. I, and I'm, that's a big statement, but I'm going to say Munster Pro Fitness is my favorite place to train in the country. That's a big statement, man. That's a, yeah, because yeah. again, very, very good equipment. A lot of Cybex, Hammer Strength, Life Fitness. 
the atmosphere was phenomenal. Everyone was really, really sound. Um, it wasn't too expensive to train there. I actually trained there in between, like, the I was watching the RBBF and there was a category on that I didn't care about, so I went off. I think everyone trains in UL, but I, I'd heard Monster Pro Fitness was quite good from an old colleague of mine, so then I went and checked it out and was really impressive. I think IB trains there quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, they'd be... Did I cover all the counties there or all the provinces? Yeah, man. Well, that was that was Leinster, Dublin, North, North and Connacht. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, would you have any in the UK? Richard? Yeah. Uh, well, the Ultraflex we were in, in Hull, was class. So good. So good. I, like, I, I, I've seen on social media and stuff a few of the older, older Ultraflexes. They're also brilliant. I, I think all, like... Because I think what Ultraflex is, is basically it's a franchise where there was a gym previously and then the Ultraflex comes in and they just fuel it with kit. Like the one in Rotherham looks unreal as well, from what I can see. Um, I think Flex and Tone in Manchester, just because it has everything. That was, it has, that was a great it was, it was great. Like I feel like I'm like, it just so old school, just rust everywhere. But at the same time, brilliant kit like absolutely everything you could want really um i think that was very very good uh ultimate fitness in birmingham is another one i'd rate quite highly uh generally because the kit's really good but again the atmosphere is really really good so they'd be in the uk they'd be my kind of go-to's um Deadly. yeah Deadly. i'd say on my end um a few different choices some that are the same <clears throat> in Leinster, I think my favorite gym is. We'll go Dublin first. Okay, Dublin, Dublin for ease of access. Oh God, I have a few, man. I'm gonna have to say a few. Um, nah, think... you have to pick. You have to pick one. Oh man, I'm gonna have to say the old Power Gym on Dominic Street. Um, but it's not I... there anymore. No, I know. Um, <laughs> oh God, and um, no, I'd I'd go with um. I'd go with Southside as well. I, I really think it has everything in terms of your kit. Um, mm. Good atmosphere, you know, it's it's near enough to everything. And, uh, you know, obviously we know the same people there. I love that mm. gym when I've been there. Um, in Leinster, I would say Gold Gym in Greystones. I did oh, yeah, very good gym, yeah. Preps there. Um, and the mm. last time I was there, um, I'm friends with Jay Abbey, so shout out to Jay for... Like, because he, he loves that gym, man. Like, every time I've been there, he's, he says, give me a call and I'll meet you there. And we'll, we'll like, he lets me in and he shows me around. And they, it's four floors now, man. They have a weights floor. They have a cross yeah, floor. I, I was there recently. Oh, man. Phenomenal. Yeah. Actually asked, very, very good. I actually asked him if I could borrow some of his kit over the lockdown. And he said, <laughs> oh, you're a bit too late to the party. You're like the 200th person to ask. I need yeah. a kit that I can open the gym again. Um, mm. the gold gym for sure I'm going to be rejoining it too um, mm. um, I would say in Connacht um, I haven't really trained in Connacht to be honest with you man so, okay. like I mean no I haven't trained there man so I can't comment um, okay um, I would say oh god no go, wait Galway is in Connacht isn't it yeah Galway City Gym 100%. Yeah. I trained there before the PCA show. Really good gym. Open to 12. Nice opening hours. Good atmosphere. Quite hardcore. I know Jer Masterson trains there. And I know I am. Um, if he comes up there and everything. And uh, Ulster, I would say, I can't remember the name of the gym we trained in. It was in the old Academy gym. One. Yes. I thought that was a phenomenal yeah. gym. Really good. It was, it was gas because it was literally in a warehouse. Yeah. Like an old school factory. Uh, like. Deadly. I love that. Yeah. Then um I haven't trained anywhere else. There is a few gyms I want to get up there. I want to get up to the gym Newry. And I want to get up yeah. to um I want to train with Brian Wardy. Uh, I want to train with Wardy up there. His gym, Dave Fox's gym. Mm. Mm. Um and then I'd say in the UK, um Flex and Tone. I've only trained yeah. in one gym and uh, Flex and Tone, that was a great piece of kit. Great pieces of kit. But yeah, the issue I had with that gym. Was they repeated pieces? So like, 
I don't think they needed as much kit. Like, I think it was very... Yeah, but I, I think the owner just wants to have everything. Yeah. But I think, look, I think if you're a bodybuilder or a powerlifter or whatever, you have no... You've no way you're not going to develop in there. To see and it was happens. cheap as well. It was like three pounds for yeah. a day pass. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah. I know Gordon Peter boosted a bit of publicity back in there. See what mm. questions I have here. Um, we have okay here's a good one actually what are the main reasons for yourself not not juicing over the years so what, what's your reason for staying natural um, was it any just personal choice or what, what's the story behind uh, that do you think yeah so basically I just want to develop my body as well as I can naturally basically that's my goal is to just get my body, you know, as muscular, as developed as I can without using any kind of enhancements. Okay. Um, I think as well, it's one of those things that, you know, once you go on, you're, you, you don't go off, as they say, kind of thing. Like, you, like, you're going to have to be on some kind of testosterone pretty much for the rest of your life if you want the to. Only, literally, the only time you would come off is when you want to have a baby and yeah. um, for health reasons. But like on my end there, um, the only reason I actually hopped on was because I wasn't aware. There was no natural feds in Ireland at the time. I mean, so I hopped on for prep. I mean, the first mm. time we met, I was still natural. Um, yeah. Um, and then I hopped on for prep. Um. Do I were like to be honest with you? If the natural feds were a bit more established, I would have stayed natural until I was around 20, 21, 22. But obviously, yeah. that would, just just didn't happen. But no, that's that's great, man. Because I think like a lot of people, um, like a lot of young guys are hopping on these, you know, anabolics at, at a yeah. very young age, and like your testosterone levels don't really begin to decline until your mid 20s, anyway. I mean, you're not fully developed male until you're like 20. Yeah. At the end of the day, I, I always mean, this. Don't hop on anything unless you're going to be competing in a federation yeah. where it's, you know, a playing field where it's utilized. If you're doing it for nightclubs or you're doing it because... Yeah, see, for, for Ibiza or for Magaloo for something ridiculous. Like, I, I just think it's... A, it's playing with fire as well, you know, like, I mean, I'm like, I'm very much a lucky person in that my body, I've gotten away with, like, my bloods have come back pretty good every time, and I come off, and I take my breaks, and, you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm blessed in that area, I don't, I've never had any negatives, but to that being said, like, you like I know so many people who have libido issues, and that's one of the minor yeah. issues. So, like, mm -hmm. this is, I'm not telling people not to take them. What I'm saying is, have a deep sit down with yourself and think: What are your goals at the end of the day? Like, do you really think you're going to be a high end competitive bodybuilder in the untested federation scene, or mm -hmm. a powerlifter? But even mm -hmm. at that, um, I I just think trained for a couple of years i mean i had trained for three years before i touched anything so i was like mm. um it's there's just no point and but e but even like there's some top natural bodybuilders who like turn pro in the natural federations and then they decide to enhance yeah, like i think kai green kai green is the biggest example jamie Dorego as well he was a yeah was a good natural so it's like yeah I'm, he was for a while yeah and i'm pretty sure ronnie Coleman turned professional naturally as well you had a few mm. like outliers, and of course, we're both friends with some phenomenal genetics, uh, uh, genetically gifted naturals. And I think, you know, mm. I think it's just utilize what your body has. And I think you need to have a deep talk. Like, I, 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 I have a lot of. I work with a couple of clients who are competitive, um, and I did at like they they were taking things before I was working with them, but. Mm. I was working with somebody now. I mean, I've worked with naturals before. And they've asked me about it, and I said, "You don't have enough tissue at the point anyway. You need to yeah 
get that base and then mm. go from there. And of course, your genetic capability comes into play as well. I mean, like some guys look like nothing naturally, but then they're hyper responders. So mm. yeah, it's a mixed bag, man. It's a mixed bag. Man. You know, yeah. really, if I have any more questions here. Um, I, th I think as well, like with the enhancement and stuff, people want to make sure that they have financial stability as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they want to make sure that like they can afford everything that has to do with it so that they, they can obviously afford their drugs, but then they can afford their, their blood tests and their doctor's appointments and all this kind of stuff on top of it. Not afford their rent and their bills as well. I mean, Well, I yeah, no, but I, that's what I mean, stability to yeah, be yeah. able to... I think like people like that's the the it's expensive, but that being said, if you're genetically gifted in the in that area, it shouldn't mm. be expensive. You should be able to more less is less is better. Um, yeah, it really is. Um, but again, like I think we're coming, we're past the hour now. We're on an hour and twenty minutes, yeah. and I think we can. <laughs> but where can people find you? I'm gonna put the handles down below anyway. I'm gonna put up the audio first, but uh, where can yeah. we find you? And what handles? Yeah. yeah. So basically, if people want to contact me, I'm at Dramatic Carl on Instagram, as well as that, I'm at Dramatic Carl on TikTok. If anyone's on TikTok, <laughs> yep. um, if anyone wants to contact me for coaching, uh, for online coaching or contest prep, there will there's a link tree website linked in my bio on Instagram. If you just fill in like a short questionnaire, I'll get back to you on that. As well as that, I am a personal trainer in Fly Fitz Delorgan. So when the gyms reopen anyway, you can see my bio on the Fly Fit website. Or again, you can just contact me through Instagram. As well as that, I have an email address, dramaticphysiques at gmail.com. You can shoot me an email. And then lastly, if you do see me training, or if you just see me on the gym floor and I look like I'm not too busy, just come up. If you recognize me, we'll have a bit of a chat. I'm always open to, you know, helping people out. Deadly, man. Deadly. Well, look, it was a delight having you on as the first guest. And hopefully this yeah. podcast, like, I look, at the end of the day, I think, I mean, there's no Irish competitive bodybuilders doing this. In, no. in our circle, in our circle. I mean, of course, there is a few in the fitness scene, but in terms of this area, there's nobody doing this. So I thought, I want to get, I want to get the voice of people out. And I think, hopefully, I think this will be easy to digest for a few people and word of mouth will get it around. And in time, um, I'm going to hopefully release this. I'll release this now in a couple of days. And, I just make it look pretty on the video as well. But uh, mm -hmm. no, it was a delight having you on, man. And thanks. Cool. Cheers for having me. 100%. And you look, we'll shoot the shit another day as well. I, I, I will probably, what I'd be interested in doing is um, get a round table. Because I don't know. I don't know the natural scene at all. Mm. That's one thing I've always, I have been interested in. So maybe mm. we could shoot a round table with them. Um, with zoom that's the capability it has but yeah absolutely thanks for thanks for cool. my man. Uh, no problem i'll talk to you soon now yeah, any, take care now anyone who's watching this again carl has his handles up and uh, um, and of course keep watching for future videos and future updates and subscribe to the youtube channel irish iron and um, this will the video will also be up on spotify and anchor so an apple so yeah all right and we are out